So um, I assume that the name of the conference, Deep Learning and, computa and uh, Combinatorial Optimization, it's either, I mean, it's end in the loose sense. So I will talk about deep learning, less so about com uh, combinatorial optimization. So a little bit about deep learning. It's a disruptive, uh, disruptive uh, line of research that changed the way that uh, we do computation, uh, that we address uh, computational problems today. Uh, it involves um, optimizing for many parameters, uh, tuning them, training them. Um, and at the end of the day, you have some uh, architecture that knows how to classify, to segment, and to reason about, uh, about what you're looking at. Uh, the methodology works great as long as there are explicit assumptions about uh, the dimension of the data. I mean, assuming that you have low dimension of parameters uh, of the data itself or that it lies on some low dimensionality space. Uh, or at the other end, if it has some spatial or temporal uh, shift invariance properties that you can utilize in order to optimize your uh, machine. Uh, what I will talk about today is, is uh, a set of problems that we have been engaged with for many years, and these are geometric problems. And the question that we address is how to take these inherently non-shift uh, invariant like uh, properties and use neural networks in order to address them, to solve them somehow. Um, so again, um, going into the Turing Awards uh, two years ago, uh, the noble of computing, uh, we have Jan LeCun, uh, now uh, NYU um, a professor and Facebook AI director uh, that introduced the ConvNet and uh, Hinton uh, that introduced the AlexNet, uh, all convolutional, and Benjio uh, that is known uh, with Goodfellow for his guns. Now, the modern convolutional neural network needs this spatial invariance property in order to solve problems. Um, uh, and, and, and these three giants uh, got the, the um, um, Turing Award for being persistent for almost 30 years since the 90s and pushing this, uh, uh, this methodology. And I still remember giving a talk, it was 2003 in IPAM, uh, when Jan Lecon was uh, giving his, uh, presenting his content and uh, uh, showing how he can uh, read, I mean, interpret uh, numbers or letters. And uh, my take home message from this workshop was to work on the growth of the distance of comparing between surfaces because this is what captured my eye. But still I remember um, that I was really impressed by the fact that you can actually throw many uh, annotated examples to a um, sort of a, a computational machine and at the end of the day get really nice results. Um, what we will do is try to follow the philosophy of René Descartes, um, who about 400 years ago introduced the Cartesian coordinate. And he did that in order to, a uh, way of translating algebra uh, in order to solve geometric problems. And the question is how to do that. Uh, let me start with a very simple problem. And this is the iconal problem. Um, I think that you can see my mouse. Um, the iconal problem is basically uh, the problem of measuring distances from a given source point on some domain, uh, such that at the source point you have that the value is equal to zero, and you can characterize the distance function to be such that the gradient is equal to the, the magnitude of the gradient is equal to one almost everywhere. In fact, what you're looking for is something which is known as the viscosity solution. Um, uh, you need to have the, the, the solution behaving in a very nice uh, numerical manner, um, thereby choosing among all, among all possible uh, numerical solutions to the problem. Now, uh, what we did, I mean, what one of my students did, Moshe Lichtenstein, uh, did is uh, using a fully connected network in order to look at the central point and uh, fit all the neighboring points together with their values, with their U values, so that the central point would uh, update itself so that it would satisfy the, um, uh, the equation above. Now, you may think that this is a trivial or a straightforward problem. Uh, so let me just go back to the area before uh, deep learning. Um, this is the evolution of uh, schemes that were working on uh, regular grids. I mean, well sampled grids. Uh, at the beginning, we had uh, uh, 95, we had the fast marching method. It's a linear problem that was uh, giving order of H. H is the spacing between uh, grid points, accurate uh, solutions. And then there have been others, um, more or less uh, the same complexity. And it took a while between, uh, I mean, for people to design these, these, uh, these solvers. 
On non-regular grids, at the beginning, it was even thought that it is impossible. So um, together with James Sethian, we introduced an order of age algorithm uh, that was running in quasi-linear time and it, it produced uh, reasonable results. And then uh, there was also a paper by Suratsky, Suratsky that implemented the Mount Papa, Dimitri and Mitchell algorithm uh, that was able to compute this kind of distance maps. They call it exact, but this is exact on the, on the numerical grid, on the um, uh, uh, polyhedron that is describing the continuous problem. And the uh, complexity was order of n squared. So in a sense, there was not much, I mean, from a computational point of view, there was not much of a difference between the two. And our problem was uh, actually giving a second order accurate algorithm for computing the distance functions with a quasi-linear uh, complexity. And the question was, can you do that? And in fact, all you need to do is take all the known uh, surfaces that you can think of, and these are uh, spheres and planes, and uh, sample them uh, in a random fashion and then fit it into a neural network. And when you do that, uh, what you get is in fact something uh, which gets really close to the true solution. And you can actually see that uh, uh, if you compare it to the fast marching method and to the, uh, what is known as the exact, uh, the solution that the network is producing is actually uh, very close to the second order uh, scheme. Now, this is a numerical evidence. There is no um, viscosity proof for convergence, but in all examples that we had, and when I say examples, you need to know how to compute distances. So for example, spheres, you can show that uh, as you refine your grid, I mean, when your grid is becoming smaller and smaller, the uh, solution of the distance is converging uh, in a second order rate, okay? Similar to what is known as the exact. Um, now the question is uh, how can we push it further to other problems? Let me show you another interesting problem. And this is the problem of comparing between shapes, okay? So uh, the question is how can we um, uh, classify shapes? And this is a classical problem in shape analysis. And it was classically addressed by trying to compare the moments uh, of, of a set of points that are describing the objects. Um, so again, classically, uh, people were taking a set of points describing an object, computing the first, second, et cetera, derivative uh, uh, moments of this object, and then trying to match or classify, fitting it into, I don't know, SPM or whatever you like, in order to classify the objects. Uh, let me write this idea of uh, moments in a somewhat different fashion. Assume that you have your X, Y, and Z coordinates for each and every point, then you lift it into, say, a thousand dimensional space. So it would be X, Y, Z. These are the coordinates of this uh, uh, high dimensional space for each and every point. And then what you do is you average along each and every axis, and then you get the average of the axes. So the center of mass would be the average of the three of the first three. This would be the first order moments, and then you have the higher order moments. Okay. So this is a way of representing how you compute. Uh, moments from uh, from a simple uh, from a simple uh, for a simple object, and then what you can do is you can use this vector in order to uh, classify your shapes. Okay, uh, now let's do the following. Let's resort to an uh, introduction of something which is non-point. This is an introduction by Sumo and Gibas um, about uh, four years ago. What they did is they trained the network to lift the coordinate of each and every point into a thousand dimensional space. And then they max pulled along each and every axis. When you do that, you get a vector and then this vector is fed into a classifier, I mean, into a regression algorithm. You can back propagate and optimize for your neural network. And then what you're actually getting is a way of classifying objects. This is the plain, uh, the vanilla, uh, vanilla uh, way of looking at point net. Now, when understanding how uh, moments are working and how uh, neural networks are working, and we can think of, uh, uh, of the similarity between the two. So we assume that the neural network is doing something uh, of lifting the X, Y, and Z coordinates into their powers, uh, if you would like to go back to classics. But neural networks has this inherent property that they find it really difficult to uh, multiply numbers, okay? You need at least uh, log n, the uh, number of bits that it takes you to, to represent each and every number uh, in order to take the power of each and every number uh, and, and to multiply these numbers. 
So what we did is we helped the, the network a little bit by uh, first embedding, I mean, by, by designing the features uh, so that they would be easier for the moments uh, idea concept to, to, to work with. So what we did is instead of just feeding the network three numbers, X, Y, and Z, we now feed the network with nine numbers, okay? So it would be X, Y, and Z, as well as uh, X square, Y square, et cetera. And we follow the same machinery as before. We train the network. And surprise, surprise, we get uh, a smaller network. I mean, the number of parameters in the network is about half as the number uh, that we had before. And the accuracy goes up. So we gain uh, uh, both in complexity as well as in uh, complexity and time as well as accuracy, which I think is an interesting way of uh, looking at point net. Then what uh, one of my students, uh, this was done by uh, more Joseph Rivlin, Another student was looking at PointNet and trying to use it as a way of uh, uh, as, as an encoder decoder idea. So let me talk about the problem first. Assume that you have a model that looks like that. This is uh, a full um, object that is given to you and you have a partial view of the, of the object in a different pose. What you would like to do is reconstruct the object uh, in the new pose given the knowledge of the original or the uh, Q given uh, uh, pose of the object. And the idea was to use PointNet as a way of taking the two, uh, I mean, this is first of all by training. So you take a full object and the partial and you train for two, for embedding in two uh, thousand dimensional spaces. And then you use this latent space as your feature in order to extract back the uh, new pose from the given one, okay? So this is the way of using the point net as an encoder decoder uh, concept in order to uh, reconstruct back objects. Um, now, traditionally, what we did in my group is, is uh, dealing uh, with uh, surfaces as metric spaces. So uh, again, if you think of, uh, of a surface as, as some uh, metric space, uh, as a manifold, then you need to attach um, uh, a metric to the manifold. Otherwise, the sphere would be equivalent to this weird object here. So we need to have the metric. And then we can measure the um, what is known as the discrepancy or the uh, uh, gomov of distance between objects uh, by trying to match between them somehow. So how do we do that? So first of all, what we did, uh, this is the definition of the problem. What we are looking at are two uh, uh, surfaces S and Q that are more or less uh, isometric. And what we would like to do is find the mapping, we call it raw, so that uh, the, uh, discrep the distortion of mapping all the distances between points on S to points on Q would be as small as possible. The first attempt, um, which was about 17 years ago, or in fact, more 20 years ago, was to take each and every surface and uh, try to map it into a Euclidean finite dimensional Euclidean space. This was what done with ACLR. The problem is that when you do that, when you take a curved manifold and you flatten it into a flat domain, you inevitably introduce errors uh, that are unbounded. For example, if we take this sphere uh, and we take these four numbers, these four points between which the distances are either, I mean, if you think of the radius of the sphere as being one, then the distance between A and A would be zero, but between A and B would be pi over two. And then when you try to take these two uh, half of great circles and embed them into, into a three-dimensional space or any finite dimensional Euclidean space, they should be along the same straight line, which means that B and C should be at the same position. But we know that B and C are along the equator and therefore uh, they should be uh, far apart from each other. So uh, it's a problem um, uh, embedding into Euclidean space. Gil Shamai showed that uh, it is possible to embed into, into complex spaces. And in fact, he had an interesting way of uh, overcoming this problem, but this would not be the issue today. So what is the issue? Uh, then jumping uh, ahead in, in, in time, uh, fast forwarding uh, what the Bronstein brothers have been doing is uh, when they were still my students were, was trying to map points from S into Q and then let these points move about so that they would minimize for this permutation of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, so D would be the interdistances, uh, geodesic distances between points in S and, and uh, Q, DQ would be the distances between points in Q and it moves about so that they optimize it. The problem was that uh, it locked into local minimas and it was a really difficult minimization problem to work with. 
Uh, then, together with the Flalo and Astasa Dubrovina, we noticed that, I mean, uh, we use the philosophy of, uh, of uh, functional maps uh, in order to represent the uh, interdistances and the, on, on both uh, uh, shapes as a low dimensional matrix involving uh, some uh, basis defined on S and a different basis defined on Q. For example, a basis extracted from the Laplace Beltrami operator. And when you do that, uh, it appears that the permutation can be written as a low dimensional, again, by some abuse of notation, some abuse of, uh, of, um, of properties, uh, it can be written as a low dimensional, solving a low dimensional problem. So again, uh, in this hybrid spectral space, you can in fact uh, optimize for DC, which is the functional map uh, matrix. I see that I run out of time, so let me just go really briefly into, fast mar into um, uh, functional maps and uh, tell you about how uh, it evolved since then. So the functional map idea is taking features, think about it as colors that paint the surface S and similar features, corresponding features that uh, color the uh, surface Y that we want to match to one another. Uh, then you take the inner product with the eigenfunctions defined on the space X and the eigenfunctions defined on the space Y. And the uh, permutation matrix can be shown to be a, a, fun, um, um, a fixed matrix, uh, which, is the, uh, uh, take, which is basically taking A uh, divided by uh, alpha divided by beta. Okay, so the permutation matrix, the connection between these two uh, metric spaces is actually related to some ratio between the uh, features pro projected onto these eigenfunctions and the features projected onto these eigenfunctions. The question then was how to uh, make a neural network out of this uh, realization. And this is not uh, our result. This is a result by Orly Tani, who actually showed that if you take features and then you blend them uh, in a way that you can optimize with a neural network, then you can actually have a neural network that is getting better results than just looking at the features themselves. So again, blending the features, you can think of the features as colors, blending them differently, uh, you can optimize for a neural network. But in his method, the loss function was uh, in fact, uh, for the loss function, he had to know exactly how each and every point on surface X uh, is mapped onto uh, surface Y. So it is a fully, um, supervised uh, version. What Oshir Halimi realized is that uh, what you can do is you can take the intergeodesic distances if you are dealing with almost isometric objects, uh, then you can take the intergeodesic distances and you can now uh, optimize for the permutation, which is what you're optimizing at the end of the day. And then uh, you get a semi-supervised or unsupervised network to, to uh, find your um, uh, that you optimize for. So again, the same machinery as before, uh, as uh, Litani's, but now with an unsupervised version. Okay, how do we push that forward? Uh, and again, we got nice results, and due to lack of time, I can just uh, refer to the paper. It's a CDPR uh, uh, paper. Okay, um, now let me do a short detour uh, into a different way of looking at surfaces and finding uh, signature for surfaces. So assume that I'm defining a metric for my surface uh, M and a different metric for my surface M. So assume that somehow I can define two uh, different metrics, matrices for the same uh, shape, from the, for the same manifold. In fact, uh, you can show that the inner product between the, eigen, the resulting eigenfunctions uh, that diagonalize the corresponding Laplace Macrami operators is uh, something that we call the self-functional map, okay? And it is a signature of the surface. So let me uh, show you uh, how it, what is going on. So again, uh, you have shapes at the top and shapes at the bottom, and each and every entry here in this, um, in this matrix uh, is the inner product of eigenfunctions that relate to the uh, regular matrix, so the regular metric and the eigenfunction that, re, uh, that relate to the scaling variant metric, okay? And you can see that all the horses have the same, the same, uh, the same uh, matrix and all the ladies have the same ones. And you can, in fact, 
use that in order to classify uh, these objects, and it obviously works for less uh, forgiving scenarios. Okay, so you can uh, use this. Uh, you, you can basically translate the problem of comparing between uh, articulated shapes into that of comparing between matrix of numbers. Uh, so again, going back to our uh, to our original problem, what we had is the features that we blend using a neural network uh, that gave birth to this uh, uh, to this permutation matrix that I optimized in a semi-supervised manner. And the question was, can I actually uh, get rid altogether from the for, for, from the features? I mean, we know that neural networks don't really like features. I mean, you you would like the neural networks to design the features for you. So what we did is we said, look, at the end of the day, we are working in a domain which is uh, extracted from the eigenfunctions of the LBO, of the Laplace Petromi operator. Uh, let's use as features the eigenfunctions that are extracted from the alternative Laplace Petromi operator, the scale invariant one, for example. And then the interactions between these two eigenfunctions, uh, between two, these two eigenspaces, would give me a hint of how to match these two, uh, these two surfaces. But there is a problem there. The problem is that I was cheating a little bit. When I'm looking at the eigenfunctions of the of any Laplace Lattermi operator, they should be equivalent up to sign changes. I mean, you can flip the sign, and therefore there is one source of ambiguity. But worse than that, if you have two uh, similar of, or identical eigenvalues, then you have a sus subspace that you need to rotate within. So. Um, uh, what we did is now optimize for the rotation of the scale invariant eigenfunctions so that they would, at the end of the day, uh, fit in the best possible way of matching the intergeodesics on Y and the intergeodesics on X. If you do that, then what you need to know is that your rotation matrix is, in fact, uh, uh, a band-limited unitary matrix, and this is, some, uh, uh, this is the constraint that you're looking at. And this is the architecture that we are optimizing for. And surprise, surprise, if you do that, you don't even have to use a neural network. You can use the backpropagation trick in order to optimize for R. Uh, and you can do it for every two uh, surfaces that you're getting. I mean, you need to do it for every two surfaces. So it's no longer, uh, it's no longer a neural network. Now, for some reason, I was uh, optimistic. And I was thinking that I would always, also have time to talk about um, uh, to talk about other problems. Uh, so again, let me just show you before and after uh, what was going on. Uh, this is the eigenfunctions painted on the surfaces before and after optimizing for R. And you can see that here, the uh, numbers, the values are different. I mean, the colors that indicate numbers are different. And after this rotation in the uh, eigenspace, you can see that uh, the objects, that the eigenfunctions match to one another. And obviously, the resulting matching uh, between the surface was uh, almost perfect. Um, so this is more or less it. I mean, they told me that I need to really be on time here. Uh, so thank you for your attention. <laughs>